We have been blessed by some wonderful music and a wonderful testimony this evening, haven't we? Uh, wonderful to be together in Christ at camp meeting, <clears throat> and I'm delighted to be with you. Um, those of you who know me well know that I love the epistle to the Ephesians, and so it will come as no surprise that uh, I am nominating four passages within that epistle uh, to you this week as life texts. I hope you will adopt these passages of Scripture and integrate them into the very fabric of your <clears throat> walk, your relationship with Jesus Christ, and that they will inspire and nurture you. And I am delighted to be opening the word together here tonight. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we come to you at the Upper Columbia Conference camp meeting this evening, the, the opening meeting of our camp meeting this year. And we long to have your spirit present in our midst to signal from the very outset the importance of our theme together in Christ. Never has there been a moment in salvation history where it was more important for God's people to be together in Christ. And so we ask that as we open the word together this evening, that your spirit would be present to, to open this, this passage of scripture, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, to each of our hearts. Apply it individually. Minister your grace to us as we do this wondrous work of Bible study together this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Entering the city's university for the new term is tricky business for you, youthful, bright scholars that you are, and you have good reason to be wary. You see, a few years back, your parents had become converts to the way to Christianity, and some amazing stories still oft told hark back to that time. There are stories about miracles, healings, just the touch of a handkerchief or an apron is enough to do it. Uh, there is the story of seven itinerant Jewish exorcists, if you can imagine such a thing, spouting their abracadabra for a fee who misuse the name of the Lord Jesus, integrate his name into their list of astral powers and deities in their exorcism rant. Well, it was a terrible mistake. Instead of departing, the evil spirits give those seven itinerant exorcists a thrashing, and the seven flee naked and wounded through the streets of that sophisticated city. And so the story goes, fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. Back then, members of the way, followers of the Lord Jesus, are so successful in attracting converts that income to the great temple of Artemis, one of the wonders of the world, income to that great temple plummets. The whole tourism industry suffers as well. A huge riot breaks out down at the theater which accommodates 25,000 people and it leads to a lot of sore throats for citizens of the great city of Ephesus who shout for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Not the best PR perhaps, but the point is this. Back then, Christianity is influential, the latest thing, a force to be reckoned with. To be a member of the way has certain cachet, clout, standing. But over the years, things have drifted back toward normal. 
pilgrimages to the temple of Artemis have almost returned to their once usual levels. Silver shrines of that temple again sell at a fast clip. The month-long spring festival honoring the goddess Artemis is again well attended. Thousands join those festivals. Thousands follow the statues of the goddess along the sacred way around Mount Pion. Her athletic contests, theatrical shows, musical concerts, and sumptuous banquets are as well subscribed now as ever. All the best bands play her songs, that lyrics of the most of the most popular tunes croon loyalty to her. The big companies sponsor her feasts, bask in their loyalty to her. So it is no secret that the campus of Ephesus University is not a Christian one. Oh, there are prayers and hymns at the university's open, opening convocations, but they are hymns and prayers to Artemis. And if you are honest about all of this, you yourself have felt the tug of it all. Being a member of the way, a follower of the Lord Jesus, doesn't carry the influence it once did. It no longer opens doors. It shuts them. To worship the Lord Jesus is to risk becoming a pariah and an impoverished one at that. So it's been very natural for you to Look for coping strategies. Ways to soften the edges of your Christian identity. Would it really hurt to attend one of their festivals now and again to sip some of their libations? Perhaps your witness to Jesus might be better heard if you weren't so odd, so out of step with the culture around you. You've even been missing... Friday evening Bible study recently. That gathering held in a disciple's home discreetly with guests entering through a back alley. But you've heard that a letter has come from Paul, the great apostle who preached Christianity here in Ephesus, the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, preached the gospel here back in the first place. And this is in the day when a letter is more performed than read. Tychicus, a close associate of Paul's, has come to town, and he will share, he will perform Paul's letter. It will be almost like hearing Paul himself. And so you tread gingerly down that back alley, your Christian identity in need of a boost, and you enter that house church. Warm greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hugs, good food, a, a great potluck. And then, with the group gathered and hushed, Tychicus stands for the performance. And it is riveting. It is gripping. And you listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of humankind. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. We sit this evening with those challenged disciples of old, those Christian university students in Ephesus. What do these words, the first, first few verses of Ephesians 2, these first three verses, what do these words mean to us 2018, 
What messages do they convey? This, my friends, is a description of plan A. Given our sinful world, it is the default plan for our lives, and it is Satan's plan. While still bearers of the image of God, we have come to understand that there is something deeply awry in us. Living the Christian life, then, is not just a matter of conquering a pesky bad habit or overcoming whatever sins and transgressions are currently threatening. You see, we do not just contend with sins as challenging and difficult as that is but we contend with sin. We are bent toward rebellion against God and toward self-destruction. Humans, by default, are caught in a pattern of self-destructive, sinful behavior following the dictates of Satan and our own innate sinful desires. Believers once were, by nature, children of wrath subject to the eschatological wrath of God. It is important to note that in offering this description, Paul employs a past tense. We were, by nature, children of wrath. Now, this does not mean that an inherent bent toward evil is no longer a reality for believers. Paul spends a considerable portion of his letter warning that sinful acts rooted in the sinful nature remain a threat for Christians. It does mean, though, that this old self need no longer dominate the believer who, through the power of Christ, can put off your old self and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24. These verses, this description of the default plan in our sinful world for humankind, plan A, these verses invite some searching questions. Is my life all too marked by the sins passion, and Satan dominance that Paul describes here? Is the past life of the believers in Ephesus, in fact, my present existence, however masked and disguised that may be by my Christian identity? Aren't you glad that plan A isn't the only plan for us? Aren't you glad for that? For you see, there is plan C, the Christ-shaped, Christ-determined, Christ-created, Christ-saturated life made possible by the mercy and grace of God. Plan C. I want that plan to be activated in my life. What about you? Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7 describes plan C. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, did what? Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and did something else for us. What else did he do? raised us up with him and did something even further for us and did what? Seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Plan C. So that, verse 7, in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If I'm not misreading that final verse, plan C involves 
something pretty amazing. God, throughout the ceaseless ages, demonstrating his grace and his kindness by the case study of your life and of mine forever. Forever. Forever being blessed by the grace and kindness of God in Christ Jesus. Plan C. Whoa. One writer describes the shift from plan A to plan Christ to plan C uh, this way in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, the grim, plodding hopelessness, long-syllabled announcement of human lostness, dead in trespasses and sin, children of wrath by nature, is shattered by a lightning bolt from heaven, not in judgment, but with intervening mercy and love beyond all reckoning. But God, the story shifts, still quoting, the story shifts with a striking suddenness to the stupendous intervention of God on behalf of his once enemies with the greatest short statement in the history of human language. It's quite a claim, isn't it? But God, because he is rich in mercy. Plan C. Paul drenches these verses in the mercy, love, and grace of God before he describes any action God has taken, he identifies these central elements of God's character, his mercy and love. He identifies those as the origin of his gracious actions. He expands on those as rich in mercy and great love, personalizing this last characteristic by adding, with which he loved us. In Paul's view, salvation is for God a deeply personal and relational initiative. Salvation is not just a mechanical legal process offered by a distant judge with little personal interest in our case. This is a father mounting the rescue of his children as it is everywhere through the book of, of, of Ephesians. It is heart work with him. He responds based on his character of mercy and love directed very personally toward us. He cannot help himself. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. And if we can bring that up back up on the screen... Uh, I'm going to see if uh, you can see that well enough to read it with me. Can you see that well enough to read it with me? Yes. All right, let's read these wonderful verses together. Hear the word of the Lord. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love to hear the people of God reading together the word of God, don't you? What does it mean, key question of the evening, what does it mean to experience co-resurrection, co-ascension, and co-exaltation with Christ? What does that mean, that we are so together in Christ that we together experience co-resurrection, co-ascension, and co-exaltation with Jesus. To understand and apply this passage, 
we must remind ourselves of the relationship of the resurrected, ascended, and exalted Jesus to the powers of darkness. Paul's hearers and all humankind once served the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, Ephesians 3, verse 10, doing worship and obeisance to various astral powers and having only a destructive pattern of life, dead in trespasses and sins, to show for it. Paul does not deny the existence of these evil and demonic powers, nor their ability to dominate human life. However, and it is a gargantuan however, in the resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus, those powers have, in God's mercy-driven and grace-filled plan, been thoroughly superseded. Their, their hold on human existence has been made obsolete. In these salvation history events, resurrection, ascension, exaltation, these salvation history events centered in the Messiah, the cosmos has shifted, reality has changed, co-resurrected, co-ascended, co-exalted with Jesus. Now, if you're struggling a little bit, <laughs> if, you're, if you're catching the cadence of this and you can tell that this is wondrous truth, amazing truth, but trying to understand what it means with some precision is, is eluding you, I, I welcome you to the club. You know, there are some Bible passages that seem to break open, spilling their meaning at your feet, astonishing you with their fully disclosed impact. Others offer a suggestive flash of insight, but seem to hide much of their meaning, wrapping it in mystery and wonder, evoking worship as much for what they withhold as what they reveal. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7 is for me of this latter type, as are many passages in Ephesians. Paul's fulsome language, piling description upon description, alerts us that words are failing him. In Greek, verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2 are one long sentence, what some call in Ephesians a tapeworm sentence. We may be as much exhausted by Paul's language as informed by it. Paul reaches toward the, the sublime, stretches toward the divine, but any thorough, fully satisfying understanding can seem to elude our grasp. What does it really mean to be together in Christ? What does it really mean to be co-resurrected, co-ascended, co-exalted with Christ? Is it liturgical? Is it the letter form of the invitation issued by issued to John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. You will remember that with a door flung open in heaven, there comes the invitation, come up here, join in the worship service of praise, going on before the throne of God, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Is it representative, Christ in experiencing resurrection, ascension, and exaltation, represents believers. We experience these cosmic acts because he is our representative. Is it participatory? Because of our solidarity with Christ, we somehow participate in his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. Is it relational? Some of you know that I have an older brother named Bill. I like to remind him that he's 15 years older than I am. <laughs> when my brother Bill uh, did something magnificent when I was a youngster, my stock went up. So you can imagine having an, an older brother, 15 years older than you are, your little kid, 15 year older brother, hero of your life. <laughs> when my brother Bill, leading the trumpet, trio in the Bugler's Holiday in the Walla Walla College Talent Show wins the grand prize. My reputation goes up, right? My stock goes up. Why? Because he is my brother. What is good for him is great for me. 
Is it relational? Is it, scare quotes, astrological? The foundational principle of astrology goes something like this. When something important happens in the heavens, it triggers a parallel event on earth. In some true reflection of that principle, does Christ's resurrection, ascension, and exaltation up there trigger spiritual resurrection, ascension, and exaltation for us down here? Is this a case of patterning or trajectory? Christ in his resurrection, uh, ascension, and exaltation scribes an arc across the cosmos, one punctuated by these cosmos-shifting salvation history events, scribes a pattern or trajectory that we are now empowered to retrace somehow as his disciples, his followers. Is it illustrative? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, which occurs just before our passage, is arguably the most important description in the Bible of the exaltation of Jesus. Paul highlights the power of God illustrated in the resurrection and the ascension and the exaltation of Jesus. Quote, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in what? In the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. How many things did God put under the feet of Jesus? All things. An amazing description of the exaltation of Jesus. Christ's dominion is limitless and unbounded. His authority and power are untrammeled, undiminished by the presence of any other power. And his rule is for all time, unaffected by any transition from age to age, unrestricted by any eschatological scheme, since in the Father's plan, Christ himself is the goal of eschatology. All things in heaven and on earth are to be united in him, Ephesians 1, verse 10. Stunningly, the divine power of God illustrated in Christ's resurrection and his ascension and his exaltation to unbounded domain and absolute authority illustrates the power now on offer to us as believers. In fact, that same power is the source of the resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of believers. Is it illustrative? Well, I suspect, though I can't see you really well, I suspect that I'm risking exhausting you in my attempt to explore Paul's meaning. But I also know that I am in no way exhausting the meaning of Paul's implied story. Once the enemies of God, now through his grace-driven initiative in Christ, we stand co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-exalted with Christ, together in Christ. Mm. Having risked exhausting you, allow me to relax a bit and illustrate a cluster of meaning of this wonderful, amazing language. Uh, The cluster I refer to here would be representative, participatory, relational, okay? (laughs) So here's a little story. You were really special to each other way back in the eighth grade. BFFs, best friends forever. But we didn't really know that until texting came along, did we? You haven't seen him, you haven't seen her in years. You don't have a clue where she lives, what he's doing with his life. But on this particular day, your cell phone vibrates and displays an unfamiliar number from a distant state. Now, what do you do when your cell phone 
vibrates or rings and you look down and it's a, a number that isn't in your contact list and you don't know where it's from. Well, these days, most of us do what? We ignore that number. Surprisingly, on this particular day, you answer it, and lo and behold, it's that long-lost best friend forever on the other end of the call. There's some, some chit-chat, a, a, a little catching up, and then comes this line. Uh, I need to tell you a story. And so the story spills out. Your once best friend forever has just won that distant state's lottery. A new car, a new house, and a million dollars a year for life. The story drones on for a while. You try to connect to it to listen. You wonder why you need to hear this story. Is your once best friend uh, just gloating, uh, going deep, deep, deep into the contact list to rub it in, to bask in success at your expense? Is that what's going on here? And then the story over, your old friend says, you're probably wondering why I called. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yes, I am. Here's the thing. When I signed up for that lottery ticket, it had spaces for two names. Suddenly the story gets a bit more interesting, doesn't it? You're listening more intently. I wrote my name on the line, and I was going to leave it at that. But then for some reason, your face came clearly to mind. I thought of you, my first best friend, and on a whim, I wrote your name on that second line. Half the loot is yours. What's your current address? Whoa. You see... Lotteries that someone else wins aren't all that interesting, are they? But when the loot is yours, it's different. And I am here to announce to you this first evening of the Upper Columbia Conference camp meeting with the theme Together in Christ. I am here to announce to you this. You really have won this lottery. This story, this story of Jesus is not just long ago far away and disconnected from your own. You are resurrected with Christ. You are raised with Him. You are exalted with Him. You are royal because He is royal. There's a place on His throne with your name inscribed. This is who you really are. This is who we really are. Together in Christ, this is our identity right now and our eternal destiny by God's merciful design. We are so tight with the Lord Jesus Christ that His story is our story. We are not mere spectators to these cosmos-shifting, reality-changing events. Believers are so personally and intimately involved that Paul can say, we have been co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-exalted with the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That being the case, a whole new array of possibilities opens before us. We have the right we have the right to turn from a demon-dominated existence to a God-crafted life. We have the Christ one right to do that. Those who are united to Christ have no need to pay their respects to those forces over which he has vindicated his preeminence. Paul will acknowledge in the last half of Ephesians, and especially in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, that this is no simple transition for us. The dominance of the powers and the corresponding negative pattern of life have real staying power, so we must constantly rehearse, celebrate, and relive the story of Christ's resurrection, ascension, and exaltation, coronation, and our part in it, just as Paul is modeling for us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. To do so is surely close to the heart of Christian faith, identity, and discipleship. 
we should read these verses, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, we should read these verses regularly in the company of the biblical records of Christ's resurrection. Matthew 27, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, 1 Corinthians 15. In the presence of the biblical records of Christ's ascension, Mark 16, verse 19, Luke 24, verses 50 through 53, Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. And in the company of the biblical accounts of Christ's exaltation, coronation, especially Acts 2, verses 23 through 36, Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 22, and Revelation chapters 4 and 5. We need to regularly rehearse and celebrate these events in the life of Christ and our part in them. Never forget Plan C, the Christ-shaped, Christ-determined, Christ-created, Christ-saturated life made possible by the mercy and grace of God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Allow me to conclude with uh, one more story. It's a, it's a true story, and uh, my wife is the heroine of many of my stories. I'm not quite sure that description applies to this one. Uh, So I've sought special permission to share this story with you, and she has graciously granted it. It happens a few years ago, and I happen to believe it's a story that deserves to be told. Haven't told it very often at all, so, but you need to hear this story. A few years back, I'm I'm, I'm on a trip somewhere. I, I can't remember just where. Some distant location, as I recall, one of those you know, very long trips to get back home. I think I was in, in India, perhaps, or perhaps someplace in Europe. And when I arrive home on that particular occasion, there's more fanfare than normal. Pam's a little nervous. And as we stand out in front of our garage, my suitcases on the driveway, having not opened the garage door for some reason, she says, let me show you something. And with that, she ceremoniously pushes the button on the garage door opener, and with a little flourish, the door opens to reveal a dark green Mazda Miata, its black convertible top down, sporting on its hood a huge red bow. I don't remember if this was close to Father's Day or not, but... The story spills out about how she has sold this and that and gotten contributions from this family member and that, and here it is, my very own brand new used Mazda Miata. (laughs) Now, I'm a little shaken by this. It's not like her to do this sort of thing, to buy a car all on her own for me, a Miata. But it doesn't take me long to warm to the idea. My very own sports car! So I I start examining the vehicle closely, worrying, I suppose, that without my wise counsel, she may have purchased a lemon. (laughs) The car is hardly new, but it, it, it seems in pretty good shape, and it looks like a lot of fun. There are some challenging questions. This will need to be my airport car. I travel a lot, and I worry aloud that there's maybe not enough room for my luggage, and Where would you put your golf clubs in this thing? But I'm into it. After all, it's mine. Quickly, I make the mental adjustments. It will all work out. I own a sports car. And it's just about then that I notice a sheepish look creeping into the edges of Pam's face. It takes her a while to summon her courage and admit to me that it's all a hoax.
She has crafted this event with a particular scenario in her mind, a a detailed way that this is going to proceed. Uh, And and she knows it's going to happen that way, and this is going to be great. She borrows the car from some neighbors around the corner, thinking that I would be quite upset about the extravagance, and especially about the idea of borrowing money from family members to purchase it. (laughs) She imagines that after I express my concerns, she will tell me that she hasn't really sold all those things and borrowed money here and there. I will be relieved, and we will share a good, hearty, welcome home laugh. But the scenario doesn't turn out quite that way. Things take a different turn than she has imagined. I really think that car is mine. For a few minutes, I am in my head a sports car owner, and better, a sports car driver. Vroom, vroom. (laughs) When I find out that it isn't really mine, my whole mindset changes. That old Miata isn't nearly so interesting. It is someone else's car. I am back, sadly enough, to my dinged up old maroon Buick Century. (laughs) But again, my friends, I am here to announce to you on the opening evening of the Upper Columbia Conference Camp Meeting that this Miata is yours. Never go back to plan A. Grab onto plan C. You, my friend, are co resurrected, co ascended, and co exalted with Jesus Christ, our risen, ascended, and exalted Lord. Would you pray with me this evening? Father in heaven, where we're struggling to understand it. We're struggling to live, live into this mystery and this wonder, which is surely at the very heart of Christian discipleship and faith. This amazing truth that somehow we are co resurrected, co ascended, co exalted with Jesus that we are indeed together in Christ. We ask, Lord, that your Spirit might take this text and interweave it into our hearts and minds, breathe it into our Christian discipleship, our relationship with you. Uh, uh, Give us the grace to rehearse these salvation history events in the life and ministry of Jesus and to ponder what it means that we are co-resurrected, co-ascended, co-exalted with Jesus. Let that mystery and that wonder and that truth inhabit our minds, uh, abide in our thoughts, shape the very nature of our Christian discipleship to you in this day and hour of earth's history and bring us to a fresh and wondrous point of unity, of being together in Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.